well, first home was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. What's up, Holmes? <laughs> you watched it, that's too bad. Beware, your host, Jonathan Holmes. Thank you for the introduction, Sinistar. And thank you, Aaron Robinson, for being on the show this week. No problem. How are you? We just uh, were talking for the first time a few minutes ago. Yep. It's really exciting to meet you. Um, and a lot of people, this is, I, I love having guests like you on the show who are hoping for a lot of people this will be a great introduction to you because you've made some games, but they haven't been as high profile as the one you're working on now which I have a good feeling is going to, to blow up pretty Thank big. You. I a hope lot of so. people are talking about it. But uh, <laughs> how so. did you get into this whole video game making thing? Uh, it really started as a hobby for me. So I was in university um, first year uh, up in the frozen wastelands of Canada, and I you know, had really been into video games when I was a kid, and then it seemed like towards the end of the 90s, video games stopped being for everyone and started being for this very specific audience. And, you know... <sighs> I, w I also wasn't allowed to have consoles growing up, so I played a lot on PC, and PC games suddenly just became shooters, it seemed like. Oh. All the, like, imaginative things like adventure games and, like, Abe's Odyssey and stuff seemed to kind of get shuffled out in, in terms of this, like, this this kind of shooter genre. So so I kind of, like, gave up on them for a while. And then, like, first year in university, my friend showed me this game called Five Days of Stranger, which is actually made by Yahtzee. It was, like, an adventure game he made uh, with this free tool called Adventure Game Game Studio, and we, she and I just had a great time. We played it like all the way through. We were like drinking wine and playing this game. And I'm like, this is amazing. I could make something like this. And then I signed up for the forums the next day, and I just like found some other people and started making games like pretty much right then. That's awesome. So, How old were you when that happened? Uh, 18. Wow, that's great. So, so how old were you if you had to guess when you first started playing video games? Uh, five, I think. We had a a really old computer with like four colors that had like Ernie's splash bath time something or other, where you're like connecting a bunch of water tubes where like there's like a little Ernie splashing around, there's like a rubber ducky. I don't remember anything except that it was really awesome. So that's like where it all began. <laughs> that sounds pretty fun. Um, yeah. uh, you said something really interesting that I've heard from a few guests prior, actually. Um, I think Anna Anthropy actually said something similar in that in the 90s, it seemed like video games changed a lot. Can you describe what you, you thought that change was? Uh, you mentioned shooters, but just in a little well, more detail. I think game companies had to start worrying about their margins quite a bit, and they saw that people, like the first-person shooter, which started, I think, pretty much with Doom, like that was so huge, and then Duke Nukem was huge, and then everybody wanted a piece of that money. Like, I, you know, it's just like where the business appeared to be going. And these weirder, more offbeat titles, like the creativity, you know, that's not a guaranteed sell. Like, it's just a business decision which I get, but it also meant that, like, a lot of people stopped playing video games, myself included, you know. I didn't play for, like, ten years. I played maybe Heroes of Mind and Magic 3, because that was awesome. I played Age of Empires, Age of Empires 2. Like, that's kind of where I stayed, because that was, like, a, still a pretty pretty fun and interesting, like, sort of genre. But, you know, everything else just kind of got... It got really serious, it got really violent, and, like, I do like violent games, but at the time I was, like, a 12-year-old girl, and I'm like, eh not really my thing. It's not really made for me. I, I'm going to go somewhere else. But yeah, so it didn't come back around until I was in college. And basically I realized, I figured like nobody was going to make any games that I wanted to play, so I should just do it myself. And that was like, before I anybody used the word indie, this was in like 2005, I think. Like I didn't even know there were other, uh, we didn't even call ourselves indie, we called ourselves like amateur game developers or like freeware game developers. So I knew about the Adventure Game Studio community, which was basically the forums and that were like maybe 300 people at any given time were online, and then that's who your audience was. And that's really how it, far I thought it would go. So the fact that this has turned into a career is kind of mind-boggling, you know, that, yeah. that a couple years later I was running into other indies when I was, like, traveling and stuff. I'm like, wait a second, how many are we? Like, <laughs> how did this happen all at once? I, I still don't really know. I think it's like, I think the game creation tools got a lot easier to use, you know. People were making engines that were that a small team of two or three people could, could make a game out of, and that was a new thing, you know, so. And, it's a you lot know, of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, people were getting fatigued from their industry jobs and going indie versus somebody like me who just started from nowhere and started making things up. <laughs> I no, it's, it's, it's really interesting that the, the backlash from, because I've heard, again, I've heard this from quite a few people, that when the industry thought they knew who their audience was and started to alienate 
the uh, or or abandon the idea of making games for the populace for everyone. Because mm-hmm. on the Atari, you had um, the Indiana Jones, and you also had Pac Man, and you had uh, all these games were kind of on the same level because technology didn't allow them to go farther than a certain level that was pretty. Um, intuitive gameplay and, and simple for everyone mm-hmm. to jump in on. When they could get complicated, they thought, now it's all just got to be fantasy and, and serious uh, simulation of what, what a, a Hollywood movie might do. And uh, <laughs> that turfed, uh, so many people got turfed from that point, but you still had video games in your blood, and when it came time for you to be an adult, it's what you came back to. And I'm hearing it that is. from so many people, that this is the first generation of developers who grew up on video games, as opposed to it being a new medium where they're like, how can we adapt stuff that's already established and legitimize video games by having it copy books and movies and stuff. You're the first person who played Ernie's Bubble Time Party House. Splash Adventure. Now I'm going to make a Splash Adventure. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. I'm so glad you exist already. Oh, Uh, thanks. (laughs) No, it's true. So as for people might not know, some of your past games. So what are what are some of the first games that you put out okay. that you continue to, to talk about, the kind that you're still um, proud of and want people to know about? So my first game was Spooks, which came out in 2006, pretty much eight or nine months after I joined the forums. We managed to get a game out, which I have yet to repeat that success. I don't know how I did that, because um, I was like a full-time student, too, at the time. Um, and that I teamed up with a programmer who I found and a musician just from the forums. Um, And the programmer for that game is a guy named Vince Wesselman, who goes by Vince 12, who released a game this year called Resonance, which is like a really updated adventure game. Uh, I don't know, it it got super great reviews. It was like a successful Kickstarter for him, and like, he worked on that game for five years, so he has a long history with the adventure games community. I thought I'd give him a shout-out, because he's an awesome guy. So he he did the coding for Spooks, and he did the coding for Nanobots, which was the next game I did. Um, And that took me a year and a half or something like that. Uh, I suppose I should tell you about what's in the games, if you like. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, let's start with uh, Spooks. What's yeah, in Spooks? so Spooks is about a little dead girl who is at a carnival, and she wins a live goldfish in a plastic bag, and then she, the, the guy who's like, gives her the goldfish is like, well, see ya, I gotta go, and then she finds out that like living things are illegal, and she needs to figure out how to rescue this goldfish, and that's the whole game. It's like, and uh, how does that play? Is that like a point-and-click adventure game? It's a point-and-click adventure, adventure game, yep. yep. So there's like lots of little dialogue trees, and, and there's like logic puzzles and inventory puzzles, and most of it takes place at this... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I did. Microsoft Paint, which is the only tool I had, so I just made it work. Like, I don't hate the way it looks now. Like, you know, I was... I, I put every pixel in that game there myself with my mouse, so, like, you know, I didn't even have, like, a drawing tablet or anything. So I'm I'm happy it... It it, uh, I, it came out without me destroying my wrist or anything. Um, and you made that in eight months or so? Yeah, eight or nine months, something like that. What? What? Is, people... People don't always know how hard it is to make games, and what you just described with the tools you had at the time was way harder than than a lot of people have it now. Yeah, and you know, like two months in, I had a hard drive crash, and the original programmer I was working with kind of bailed on me, like disappeared into the internet, that people do, so I had to like start over. Like, I had nothing. I I, like had a a build of the game that I was screen capping the backgrounds from to like redo. I had to, yeah, no, it was, I almost didn't finish it. I was like, I had posted in the forums, like, I'm working on this game about this goldfish, and then the hard drive crash, and then I was, like, so demotivated, I didn't want to work on it. But then I was getting, like, messages from people, like, private messages, like, hey, you still working on the goldfish thing? And I'm like, oh, I guess i got to finish it for these, like, three people who reached out to me. So, like, I don't know. I've seen this quote around lately that's, like, it costs nothing to encourage an artist. I think it was Kevin Smith who said that, you know, and I'm just like, that's really true. Like, I might have just given up at that point, but the fact that people wanted to play it made me want to finish it. So. Huh. Yeah. Wow, so so three people at that point yeah, felt like three, a lot huh? to you. Two yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm yeah, so glad yeah. that they were there, and I'm yeah. glad you, you did the thing. And then Thanks. how did that game go over when it when it came out? Oh, well, it got reviewed really well. Um, you know, the Adventure Game Studio people can vote on stuff, and it won a couple of awards that year. Uh, I think best, best non-player character or best player character, I don't remember, and then best music, so yeah. Pretty neat. Um, and that was just really encouraging. You know, people, like, on those forums, people were making little tiny games all the time. They, they kind of get lost in the shuffle, but, like, I think it was word of mouth that let people keep playing mine. And the rating the rating hovers at, like, 90% still on the Adventure Game Studio website. It's pretty nice. Wow, people should go play it right yeah. away. It's uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> about Adventure Games, they did die a harsher death, I think, than just about 
any other genre in the in the '90s. Platformers, you know, yeah. I've had I've had a lot of time to think about this, and I think what we saw, like that versioning of creativity in the early '90s, was just a limitation of what video games could actually do. Like they had so little graphics capability, you know, that what they could display was a background, like a picture, and then a couple of moving sprites, and then some talking, like that. Not very intensive for the computer, but nothing could be like real time, you know. And then, and then like as adventure games evolved, you got things like Zork Grand Inquisitor and Zork Nemesis, and and people started to throw in like movies, you know, like FMV actors and video games, and like that was kind of the wrong direction, I think. I mean, I don't know. It it just like their attempt to make them more serious and more like movies got away from what was cool about them, which is that they were super mm -hmm. weird, and they're usually the product of like one or two people just being like. What else can we put in here? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you there know. was was the, one of the FMV ones, Phantasmagoria. Does that Ooh. sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's so embarrassing now to pretty, look back it's on. It's pretty hard to watch. I I found out about <laughs> okay. it like six months ago, maybe more than that. Uh, and I I don't know. Somebody mentioned it on Twitter. Maybe Lee Alexander did. And I just like started watching videos of it on YouTube. And I'm like, oh my god, this got made. They made a sequel. This is popular. Uh, yeah, people were so concerned with being on the the cusp of what was new and what uh, was, technology was capable of, they didn't notice that it was uh, a nightmare. Were, I mean, it yeah. does have a certain surrealist, yucky feeling to yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's very unsettling, but not in ways I think that it intended. You know, it's yeah, it was the first video game with actors in it. I think is what oh. Roberta Williams has said. So that's pretty interesting. Like they didn't really know what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and God bless them for trying, but I'm, I'm glad that... I don't know. Uh, There's so much weird stuff in that game. Like, So, having worked on video games, like I know how the sausage is made, and, and I noticed something about the main character, which is that whenever you click for somewhere, she'll turn her head, and then she'll walk in that direction. So, like, no matter where she's facing originally, she'll turn her head. And I realized they would have had to capture, like, eight directions plus eight different head turns, like wait a second, somebody's job was to clip out all these frames of this woman and, like, just, just to get her to turn her head. It's like, you wouldn't even notice it. It's just like that was a feature set that somebody up at the top demanded, and I'm like, oh, my God. It's so tedious. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was, was nightmarish to work on that, but they were all excited. They felt like they were, like, the first people on the moon, yeah. first people to make video games, like, movies. Or yeah, funny, like, legit. yeah that, that, like, movies had the credibility that games didn't at that time. Like, even if you watched the behind-the-scenes of working on the King's Quest games, the things that they say are like it's like having a little movie all to yourself. Like it's it's nothing like a movie, but that's what they thought. You know, people would would glom onto. I guess you know, like mm -hmm. that's that's what's cool about this is that it's telling a story. I don't know. I should say I love the King's Quest games, and I, I really like Roberto Williams' work. But Phantasmagoria just confuses me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I I played a lot of uh, the Lucas Arts games, mm -hmm. and then Resident Evil came out. And as a young, hormone-filled boy who just wanted to release all of this stupid aggression that I had in me, whether I wanted it or not, I was like, I don't need Monkey Island anymore. I'm just going to be doing those shotgun decaps all night, guys. Call yeah. me later. And yeah. that kind of killed the genre, though now that I'm 36 and my, my hair has fallen out and I'm uh, mellowed with age, I'm really drawn to coming back to the... Uh, the adventure game genre, and I, I feel like there's been kind of an insurg uh, resurgence in general. Um, people are, are completely in love with everything that Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer do, no matter what. Just the yeah, idea of sure. them, they're in love with it. So what, what do you people. make of the uh, the general resurgence of of interest in the adventure? And oh, and well, of course, I Walking think, Dead, which is basically... Yeah, I think it's, it's this wider audience thing. Like, video games started to mean something very specific, you know, about shooting and guns, and then just recently with the rise of, like, tablets and stuff, we've started to see these little adventure games show up again in a different form, you know, and people, like, the casual games thing, like, that was already, that's, like, old news now, but everybody was just, like, shocked that, like, oh, my God, middle-aged women want to play video games? And it's like, of course they do. Like, and if, <laughs> like, the hidden object games are an example, but also, like, they started making adventure games, those companies, you know? There's a series from Big Fish called uh, Drawn the Painted Tower. They're actually really interesting. They're pretty dark. Um, it's about a little girl whose paintings come to life, and it's, like, a pretty... It's, like, rainy, and the music's all sad, and you're, like, exploring this ruined house and stuff. Like, I try to tell people that stuff doesn't have to be purple and pink to appeal to women. It's, like, 
if you look at what women choose to play, it's a lot of like Victorian horror. There's a lot of like murder. You know, it's not even it's like mystery stories and stuff. At least as far as like older women are concerned. So it's like this idea that w women players are going to demand that things be made, you know, cutesy is is just pretty ridiculous to me. You know. <laughs> yeah, I like cute games more than most women I know. Uh, yeah. I'm told to get <laughs> off Animal Crossing. <laughs> all the time, so so uh, people can watch TV or play something else. Uh, do you have any general thoughts, and this is just off the, the cuff question, about this misunderstanding of women that seems to be not quite industry-wide, but yeah. pretty close. Uh, where do you, what do you make of that, and do you think it's changing? And if so, what's I changing? I think it is changing. I think it is, but like, personally, my own experience is that when I'm at some place like E3 and I'm showing my game, you know, it's usually like like pretty young guy, like a student will come up to me all shy. He's like, "Can I ask you some questions about women in video games?" You know, like they really want to know. Like, I'm like, "Okay, you know, you can ask me some questions." And then his question starts with, "Okay, why do women?" And I'm like, "No, no, friend, I am not women. I am a woman. Okay, <laughs> like I I don't know. I don't. I can't speak for everybody, but mm -hmm. I think that." there's this fear that the games that people love will cease to be something they love, that they'll mm -hmm. change in some way that's, that's very threatening and unwanted. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, it comes from a place of being very scared about, mm -hmm. about the thing they love changing and the thing that's been their hobby, you know, and their, their source of their like peer interactions. Like they don't want anything coming in there that interferes with that. And I, I do understand that, you know, I think probably, I, I don't know where the hostility comes from. That might be part of it, though. It's just, like, this thing that they have that's theirs is not so much theirs anymore, and that's, like, they get pretty scared about that. Yeah. I don't know how to, yeah. I don't know how to fix it. You know, I'm just... I'm going to keep making my own games. Like, I think, you know, like, people ask me, you know, what can we do? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just, I just like making games. I don't know. Well, hopefully that'll be enough. Hopefully, by continuing to make games and people play them and enjoy them, That'll diffuse the fear and the anger somehow. I hope and so. That, you know, yeah. that, and especially like indie games, which is what I'm making, like, they're very unconventional, you know, and like the stuff that comes out of indie games is phenomenal. It's so interesting and so cool and so full of life and spark and like individual influence, you know, it's like one person or two people telling a story. And people, like, we've seen with the humble indie bundle and stuff, there's a huge appetite for that. And I get the feeling that a lot of the people who buy that stuff are not gamers, you know. And I, I think that, you know, the fact that indie games will run on, like, older computers, you know, is, like, they have a long tail of sales after they come out in a way that, that AAA games don't, you know. AAA games are very much, like, flavor of the month, and then they're gone. Like, I feel kind of bad for the teams that work on them because, you know, it just, like, this thing you created, it kind of just gets buried as the next new thing comes out, you know. But, yeah, I've yeah. talked to a lot of sad, sad AAA developers. Is that right? Who, is that Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they put everything they have into a game for three years. Um, yeah. And then it just gets, eh, it was all right, but I liked the other game in the series more, uh, 7 out of 10. And they're like, no. that. And then it's completely forgotten based on, yeah. on just that. It's, uh, it's a painful, uh, of course they get the satisfaction of knowing that millions of people checked out their thing. Absolutely. But the, they don't feel like they were understood or or that they said something that people heard a lot of the time, yeah. which is pretty sad. It is pretty sad, you know, and I, I've known people who have come out of that and moved to the indie space. That's usually how I meet them. I don't really know a lot of people currently working in AAA studios. But, like, the personal sacrifices people make to work on these games are, I don't think gamers just think about, and they don't have to, but maybe they should, you know, like the divorces and stuff like that. I mean, it's like if, you're, if your spouse is always crunching and they're away from the house for, like, if they're working, like, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks, you don't have a life that's not the game. So it's it's just such a shame, like, the way that we're, it's, like, treated as disposable entertainment, you know. I think films, even, people talk about them years later, and they compare them to other films in a way that's, like, you know, they compare them to, like, older films, and, you know, what's what are they doing new with the genre and stuff? Like, they stay in, in people's minds, but, like, games are so tied to the hardware that they just become obsolete, and then you can't play them anymore. It's just, like, it's a really such a churn, you know? It's, like, mm. kind of sad that it works that way. I yeah, that's why, that's one of the reasons I was 
quadruple depressed about the the PS4 because oh. I don't even know <laughs> what to. Depressed. Yeah, sorry Terrible. about that. Yeah, that was awful. Uh, I don't. I can't want one right now because I don't want to throw away all my PS3 games, and I don't want. To, I just hope the PS3 never stops. Basically, at this point, I hope the PS4 mm-hmm. comes out. Want to hold it until it's okay. Tell it it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's okay, Last but, uh, Guardian will still come out. You can play the game about the the fox thing with the wings. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, a lot of people come to me for that comfort because I work somewhat in the industry, and I just have to tell them, no, it's never coming out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not, Santa yeah, Claus. Not real. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but you've used the term gamer a couple of times. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you how I interpret it when you use it. Okay. And that Don't is... get me in trouble here. Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> no, I, I, I would never dream of it. That's the last thing I want to do. But uh, I do think it's a really interesting term. It's a charged term. And everyone uses it a little bit differently, so I don't claim to know what exactly you meant by it. Mm-hmm. But when I hear it, I always think gamer is someone who has their identity connected with the fact that they play video games, yeah. and they like themselves a little bit more than they would if they didn't play video games. Like yeah, that, they, when they think of themselves as a gamer, they get a little bit of a lift and think, and 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 that lift can be kind of addicting to some people who identify as gamers and think, well, I'm going to like the most gamerist thing I can like because then I'm going to feel a little bit better about myself. I'm not going to yeah. like those games because those aren't gamery games. Yeah. And, and it's and often they, they, those... I'm sorry, go ahead. And, you know, yeah, they, they, they put down people for not being enough of a gamer because they, you know, they, they play on the Xbox, they play on PC, or, you know, whatever multitude of reasons somebody's not a real gamer. I think that is where that comes from, is that identity that, like, they, they themselves want to hold, you know, like... They've put so much time into this hobby that, like, they it's like who they are, and they don't want anybody else claiming that as their title because they worked so hard for it, you know. And, and like, I see that as being related to a lot of the stuff you were talking about before about this feeling that if people who don't look like them, if people who aren't their gender, whatever it may be, get into the industry, then are, are they really gamers anymore? Or is it just everybody the same? And then that yeah. kind of elitism or that entitlement gets uh, diffused. Yeah, I think you. I think you're onto something with that. You know, I don't really know. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't have a lot of insights beyond you know what I've been able to see from like the way the internet reacts to things. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, the internet is a. It's a strange um, perspective you get from it because it's only the people who want to say something on the internet that you get to hear. There's uh, millions who aren't, in their minds, content creators. They're just yeah. observers. They're interested. Whereas the commenters are all mini content creators, and they're thinking, mm-hmm. "I'm going to write a comment that's going to uh, change the world." Sure, change- they want to interact with the the media that it's in front of them. And I I do understand that. You know, it's like TV didn't have that. You know, like if somebody on TV said something you didn't like, there was nothing you could do <laughs> except call the network. And now it's like, oh, hang on, I can give give them my two cents. You know. This person is wrong, and I'm going to tell them why they're wrong. Like, in theory, it's a good thing. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is a good. It's like communism. <laughs> it's good. It's but like it's communism. Not good. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say. No, I was going to say on the flip side of that gamer thing, um, there are people who call themselves gamers, which is kind of like wh- how I use the word. It's like people mm-hmm. who call themselves that, versus like. My game Gravity Ghost is pretty atypical in that you don't die in it. You're you're actually playing as a ghost, so you can't die. But it's still really tricky. There's a lot of challenging jumping puzzles, but if you miss a jump, you just orbit around and you can try it again. You know, so it's like forgiving, but also really hard. Um, and I and I show it to people. You know, if I'm out and working, I'll be like, "You want to play this?" And they're like, "I don't really play video games." Like, hundred percent. Like, if somebody's just like at a cafe, like, "I don't really play video games," you know, and I'm like, "Just try this one," and they're like. It's actually just fun to jump around. Oh, yay, this is fun. You know, like, they like it. So it's like, you do like video games, and I bet you play video games, but you want people to know that you don't really play video games because that's, like, almost a bad thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they uh, people who call themselves gamers often mean it in the positive, and then they make a movie called Gamer, which is just about a guy, like, blowing people's heads off and being a slave to the man, and it's uh, completely... So the, the term is... Oh, yeah, it's uh, that hunky dude from uh, 300, Muscles McBristle or something. It's got a beard, he's <laughs> that got... That sounds right. Yeah, it sounds Okay, I, right I haven't there. heard of that. It's just a movie yeah. about a guy playing video games? It's about a uh, future where when you play a video game, it's not a video game, you actually control like an ex-con, and have him just shoot people. 
and it paints the picture of the actual gamer who's like barely in the movie is just this like skinny, sad, doesn't want to live a real life, just trapped in a virtual existence because he's too afraid to be himself mm. person. And the star is just this muscly dude who like breaks from the system and kills Dexter. This is getting very philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to ask track. what are games in a second? What is art? Should I stare at my hands? <laughs> what am I doing with my life? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, uh, it often comes up. And I'm going to avoid it, though, because people hate it. Um, you <laughs> you so have I. gone on. <laughs> I figured you did. And you've gone on to, to teach about video games. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, when, yeah. When did that start? Uh, about three years ago, um, I... How did it get started? Oh, I got, um, so I was involved with Columbia College in Chicago because um, they got in touch with me. They wanted to run a summit to teach uh, teenage girls how to do get video game design. So I said, cool, yeah, I'll be a speaker for that. That's awesome. So I had this group of uh, about 12 girls who I worked with for a week, and they we talked about, like, you know, what do you like in video games? And, and some of them were like, I like Facebook games. And some of them were like, I like Final Fantasy, you know. And so we just talked about what we liked, and then, Working forward from that, they like came up with a design for a video game that they wanted to make. You know, it, it wasn't going to get made, but it was just like the idea. And what they came up with was an abandoned theme park, the female hero, and like it's you're fighting evil mascots like that are in the, the theme park, and you can collect light bulbs that you can make a safe space where it's light where they won't come in and stuff. And the weapons you have are like broken rides, like the chain from the the, the swing chains or whatever. The, you know what I mean? Uh, and it was just so creative, and like it's a violent game. But I was like, so do you think gory? They're like, no, not gory. No, you're just hitting these like giant fuzzy mascots that are like, yeah, no. It was really, really entertaining working with them. And I think maybe the people who organized that wanted the girls to come up with something transformative or like peaceful. It's like, no, this is what they wanted to. This is what they would make if they had the resources, right? I just decided to let them go with it. <laughs> when when did that come out? So that I... that was in. 2010, 2009, something like that. So that was over the summer. Oh, Spectre ripped you guys off. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's just Epic Mickey. Just like you're in an event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what a dink. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Warren. You're a great yeah. guy. Uh, so, so that was something I did for like a week at, with the college. And then so they knew who I was. And then it, it they came to me and said, we have this this term that's only two weeks long. It's right after the Christmas break before actual the semester starts. It's, so if you want to teach a class then, we'll call it the Indie Game Sprint. And I said, hell yeah. So... Basically, the whole purpose is to create a game in two weeks. And the first group of students I had, most of them were like third year, fourth year kind of design majors. And a lot of them had never actually finished a game before. Like what they were doing was the programming track or the design track or the art track. And they never had a chance to work with each other to make something or to even finish something. Like they were in the middle of their senior project, which is a huge multiplayer game. But that's a very different experience than like finishing a game with like two other people. And so, yeah, they were in little groups of three. And a lot of them were really like... The designers were pretty new to coding and stuff, so I'm helping them with like really basic debug stuff. And like, but everybody by the end of those two weeks finished the game. Like, it was really remarkable. And I have them on my website still. I think you looked to it in the post. But yeah, yeah, I did. They did a great job. And like, so that got me a gig in Sweden, <laughs> teaching college students the same thing, but in three weeks. Um, so, what year was that? 2011. I flew to Sweden by myself in November. <laughs> Just like got on a plane. I didn't. I didn't know any Swedish. I like got to the airport and I realized that I didn't know what their money was called. <laughs> I just assumed somebody would speak. So I'm at the like the currency exchange counter and I'm just like, "Hi, can I have 200 American dollars worth of kroner?" <laughs> <laughs> like that was kroner, by the way. I figured it out. Um, but yeah, so I just like was I. It was quite an adventure. It was really fun. It was just like such a different world, you know. Um, but I worked with these students, like, there were actually 50 of them, and they were in really big groups of, like, eight people. They, they, they made, like, six different six different groups or something. Um, and I just spent those three weeks, like, every day just running from group to group, like, debugging their stuff for them. And by the end of those three weeks, they, they all finished the game, too. Like, so that kind of became my thing, I guess. Um, and then I, I teach the Chicago class every year, I just, every January. And then I got to come back to Sweden also uh, last year. And I got, this time I got to bring my boyfriend with me. He's also an independent game developer. So it was a little bit easier on me. I didn't have to debug everything. <laughs> That's yeah. a, so you went from teaching 12... How old were the girls? Um, in, in the high school, they were, you know, high school age, so 15, 16, sure. something like so, that. 
14 to 18. Yeah. 12 of them. Yeah. And then suddenly you're in Sweden. Yeah. Teaching. teaching. And did you have any background in teaching before that? No. Whoa. So <laughs> that that's such a that is such an indie video game story. Well, in that I think, you just show up and do it and hope it's a real thing. And you did think, it. Yeah, thank you. I did. You know, and I, I think it comes from a place of like knowing where they're at. So for myself, like I I took a programming course in college, like one one course, and it was so dry, it was so by the book, it was all about the rules of programming, and the stuff you had to make was very, very specific, and I, at the time, I was already making nanobots, like, that's what I was working on, which is, like, this crazy colorful thing about robots, which I didn't code, I had, you know, Vince was coding it for me, um, it's like, I really want to fill that, that gap, you know, between what I know how to do, which is, like, an if statement, and, like, making an entire game, but, like, getting there is really hard, but what I like about teaching is that these students and their little groups come up with an idea that they're all like on board with, and then I show them how to make that idea. So they're learning to code, but they're also learning how to code something that they want to make. And so yeah. like that motivation is carries them a lot. You know, like I come in right at the moment where they're stuck, which completely sucks if you're programming and you're stuck because you don't have the experience to know where the problem is. And like for me to come in and just like, okay, you're spelling that wrong, or you know, this is case sensitive and it shouldn't be, or whatever. Like if I couldn't come in and fix that, they can keep moving forward, and like that's what I like to do, because, like, that's what I want somebody to do for me, but, you know, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. Uh, to me, the difference between uh, a success and a failure isn't so much talent, but that moment where you decide, am I going to quit? And then for some reason you don't quit, even though yeah. you're miserable. Yeah. The, the people who don't quit eventually get there, um, but most people, unless they really love it, um, they end up quitting, but you help get people through that point uh, yeah. to where they can get the satisfaction to, to keep going. Yeah, and I have a vested interest in this because I want to see more interesting games. You know, I want to see people do different things, and I like to see, you know, people who don't come from a games background, I like to see what they make, you know, and I like to give them the tools to do that and just, like, sit back and see what comes out of it. The Swedish students are really thoughtful. Like, in the third week, they had a big meeting with their professor, and Steve, my boyfriend, and I were sitting in the room, we, like, wait, the, the students get to have feedback about what's going on in the course? Like, it was very democratic, you know where they're just having, like, uh, an open, like, criticism session about the course itself, and they're like, well, we like having Aaron and Steve here, <laughs> um, but we are worried that, uh, you know, this team has learned about state machines, but we are making a different kind of game, so we have learned about, you know, just different... So they're, you know, they do want to have, like, a comprehensive education, and, like, they worry that the games they're designing, you know, if they're only working on that game, they're not going to learn what this team is learning. So they're trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. I'm like, God, it's so, so clever. I don't know. It's like, but they're they're now aware of what else there is to learn, you know, because mm. they see what other students are doing. They see more of what that space looks like. So, you know, h helping them bridge that gap, like in a long term, that's obviously up to their professors. It's not up to people like me. But it's, it, I don't know. Sure, <laughs> I don't that, that makes a. But but you managed to make games without being taught so much. You you learn from other people and you taught yourself but you didn't go to, to school for it. So where where do you see the place uh, of a formal education about video games? Where, where What purpose do you think? I think that it can, like the line between a beginner and a finished game, if you go through a school, it can be a lot shorter. You know, mm. you learn what you need to know. I feel like I'm still piecing things together. Like I don't, I think maybe if I could do it all over again, I would do computer science. I did psychology, you know, um, just so I would have a better framework of, of what it is that, like, you know, how, how everything slots together and what's the best way to start designing something, you know. I feel like right now I, I have game ideas and I start to build them, and then it turns out, oh, it's actually really complicated what you want to make, you know. Uh, Gravity Ghost being the main example, I mean, I started working on a game uh, that was like a little spaceship shooter because I was trying to learn how to program. This was like three years ago now. Um, so I made a little ship with a gun and things that were firing at you, little turrets and little enemies that would chase you around, and, and I was like, yeah, this is okay, but then I started to put in planets, and I'm like, what if the planets had gravity, and you had to, like, steer against the gravity, and, and all of a sudden I stopped caring about the bullets and the enemies, and I just started taking them out, and then I was like, well, what if it wasn't a spaceship? What if it's a character jumping on these planets? And then and I, I made something like that, and it, I thought it was really cool. It was, like, pretty difficult to control, but it was interesting. I'm like... I've never seen a game like this. I'm going to make this. And then it turns out that that's really, really hard to make. Like, it's really hard to make. <laughs> you know, there's a thing we do in the I'm game. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, there's, like, there's a mechanic in the game that's, like, 
I, I wrote a blog post about this, but it's like people really like to run in circles around the planets, even if there was no reason to. It's just like fun to keep running, you know. Um, so I decided to make that into a game mechanic. So right now, if you if you pick up a certain trail type like water and you run around a planet, then you make a water planet, and then you can do dirt and seeds and you can grow little plants and stuff. Um, so that's pretty cool, except like. Figuring out when the character has run in a complete circle is actually a lot of really difficult radian math. <laughs> mm, so. You know, it seems so simple because, like, oh, it's just running in a circle, but it's like that's the kind of thing I would design and then not realize how hard it would be to implement. Um, I really lucked out in that I found this awesome programmer at GDC last year. Uh, his name is Michael Stevenson. He's an awesome dude. He came from animation, which is really neat, and then he just taught himself C Sharp. So we have a good, like... I don't know, like, rapport going, I guess, because I can just be like, I think it would be really neat if the game did this. You'd be like, okay, I'll try to make that. You know? Like, <laughs> well, I was just going to say, it sounds like it would be great if you just had a team of people and you could have the ideas. and Doing what I the... say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people have that. Um, most of the developers I know who are um, of a certain budget at this point, they don't have, trouble themselves with a lot of that stuff anymore, even though they, they sometimes feel guilty about it. Uh, yeah, so would you want to have a, a gun. Is it, would you want a team if you could? Well, that would be super neat. I mean, I think at that point, my role would be more about like setting. I mean, I do this already, but like setting the milestones and making sure things get done. And I become more of a project manager and designer. I've done that too. I actually had an educational games gig a couple of years ago. Um, but it's 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 pretty difficult to manage a big team. Like, mm -hmm. I was managing, like, eight people, and it's just, like, super hard. <laughs> you know, like, like anybody, like, that's the reason managers get paid more is in business than, than the people beneath them. It's because that job is really hard, making sure yeah. people are working on, on what they need to be, and, and that they're happy, you know, in their work. So it's, like, it's a lot of, like, emotional energy that I'd rather be spending on making a video game cool. <laughs> sure, that makes yeah. sense. So the, the trade-off is if you add a team... You would be constantly risking: Are they going to do it? Are they happy? Are they going to quit? Yeah. Are they going to do it wrong? Are they going to uh, yeah. versus if, the energy it takes to? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. If yeah. there's a miscommunication at any point, and what comes out is not what you intended, then it's like we not only do we have lost time, we have to go back and fix it, and you know the artist's work is getting thrown away, and he doesn't like that, and you know so like there's a lot of like potential for things to go wrong. Yeah. Like, I can do it, you know, I, I don't mind it, but I'd rather be working with these really small teams to make something very constrained in scope. I think that's, like, what, I'm, what I want to be doing, you know? Like, that's, it's less to worry about. I mean, I was, um, so Mike is my programmer, and I, initially, we, I was, like, paying him every month, and then, you know, I was, like, you know, kind of running through my savings here, would it be okay if we did a royalty agreement? So that's our deal now, you know? So, um, so when the game comes out, you know, he gets his percentage and stuff, and, we have to formalize all that still, but, you know, we've talked about it and stuff. So it's like my motivation to make the game good is also it's not just like my salary now. It's like I want him to get his time's worth, you know. If, and the game doesn't even have to do super well, you know. If for an indie game, it just has to do, like, middle of the road for me to have enough money to live for another two years, you know. Like, I I live very cheaply, so, you know, I hope, I hope everything works out. It's not, you know, it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, it it's not just you, it's somebody else, so you're mm -hmm. kind of... The, the the mother of yeah, the family. Something like uh, that. But it's I not did that a, big of a family, which is good. Yeah, I did a... So I mentioned I've worked, I'm, I'm paid for the entire game out of my savings, 100% um, so far. And uh, I to be able to afford to do this, I did this educational games contract for a year. Uh, it was just... It came through a friend of a friend's. It was up in Wisconsin, and I was like, I'm going to do it. So I, I went and I lived on my friend's couch for a year and, like, <laughs> just, like, would walk to work every day and, yeah. No, it was pretty hardcore. It actually wasn't a couch. It was um, cushions from like a lawn chair stacked up on top of each other, and then a Boy Scout sleeping bag of board from my brother. And that's like, ah, <laughs> uh, to be young. Yeah, I know what you. I mean. don't know. I, I, it's, I'm like, you know, this is this is part of being indie. I don't want to be like a burden on anybody. You know, I don't. I don't know. I. It's like if I can't afford to do this, I shouldn't do this job. You know, I'm. Mm. It's not a charity I'm running. So I'm. You know wanted to be able to fund it myself. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think I think we'll be able to ship it this way, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You're hoping yeah. to get it out this year? Yep, yep, 2013 for sure. And, like, watching that, like, balance go down in my savings is, like, a pretty good motivator <laughs> to, like, get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I can imagine. It's uh, nice though. Like the game is is pretty much set right now. Like all the all the the fun game stuff is there, but we're missing stuff like the the level maps are going in right now, and like you know some of the story stuff I'm just starting to put in. You know, I made myself not do any story stuff until the the rest of the game was done, which I think was a good move because my previous games have been adventure games, which are very much about story. Um, but this is like a physics game where you're running and jumping and doing cute things. So sure, and like so terraforming. This... So. Yeah. Did you resist putting story in first so you wouldn't like rely on story or you wouldn't get distracted by it? I figured it could be a rabbit hole that would never end. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if I if I have this time ahead of me that I can work on this game and I start working on the story, there's a chance that the important game stuff might get put in the back burner and that's not what I wanted to happen. So I just said, no story, only game. <laughs> And uh, we've talked a little bit about what the game is, but mm -hmm. let's be totally... Let's just talk about that so people okay. really think about that for a while. You are a ghost, mm -hmm. and you can jump. Mm -hmm. And you can yep. be on a planet. Yep. Um, so the game is calculating the pull of gravity on you at any given moment. So if you're out of the space and there's like two little planets and you jump off of this one, the gravity from this one is going to start pulling you in. And you can steer yourself in the air a little bit, so... If you get good at the game, it's really fun to just like zoom around. And, and the game is, in every level, there's a star that you need to get, and that unlocks the exit door, and then you can go to the next level. So it's just about trying to fling yourself up to that point where the star is. And so you kind of have to use the gravity fields. And there's usually a couple different ways to, to solve every room, which is nice. I kind of call them soft puzzles. You know, you have, to, you have to actually think about the gravity. There's like, there's moving, moving planets and stuff, which means they're pulling their gravity field along with them, and you can kind of, you know, Move along with it. I know it's it's hard to like explain without seeing it, but like, mm, actually... no, no, it, I, 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 it seems. Hopefully, it's. Uh, I'm not wrong. It sounds pretty straightforward. You are platforming and keeping in mind the physics and gravity, um, and it's it's 2D. Uh, did you do the graphics yourself? Mm -hmm. And it's it's a beautiful look. Thank it's you. a very hand drawn storybook feeling. Did that take a long time? Yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet it did. Yeah. yeah, it looks like it did. Yeah. Um, uh, but, so, but from there, it sounds like the player is given the feeling that they can improvise a little bit mm -hmm. and just enjoy being there, and it's not like you're finding the one road to, to the goal. It's yeah. mess around and see what roads you can make or see yeah. which roads you can find, which is, yeah. which is a feeling that people like. And yeah. are there uh, any, any bosses... Any junk like that? Uh, no, there's no fighting. No, you know, it's a I jumping game. Yeah, exactly. No, it is. Um, there will be like a little bit of story, a little bit of like finding other characters and then talking to them and stuff, but nothing that's like anything approximating a boss battle. But there's terraforming, <laughs> I, which is there the is thing. terraforming. Yeah, I don't see yeah. a whole lot of that these days. No, and I was surprised. Like I, I feel like personally, I've I've played a bunch of games that had terraforming as at least something you could do, but as like a game mechanic that is a, a central one, I haven't seen a lot of things do that. And like, I would I would say to people like it's it's a game about like creating things rather than destroying things because it's like you're on these barren planets, but you have this ability to like make things grow on them and stuff. And I don't know. I without I don't want to give away too much of the story, but like people read into that a lot when they play it. They're like, oh, she's like a Mother Earth character. Oh, you know, like I get it. You know, they they have their own like explanation, and I think I'm probably not gonna like, you know way in one way or the other. It's like, however people want to interpret what's happening, that's cool, you know. Maybe the best story is the one they can write in their head. Oh, sure, giving them the opportunity, just like you give them the opportunity to solve the, the puzzles in their own way. You can yeah. give them the opportunity to see yeah. what it means in their own way. And what, like, does terraforming, uh, sorry, what does terraforming do for you, gameplay-wise? Um, there are certain stars that you need to get that are, like, in the center of planets. They're like locked away in the rock, so you need to plant a bunch of things so the roots come and they like pop the star out of there for you, basically. And huh. then we would like to have some stuff with uh, little animals that start spawning when you have plants for them to eat. Um, we're still figuring out how that's going to work. I have an idea how to make it work, but we'll see. <laughs> we Sounds pretty say. awesome. Yeah, I, I hope it will be. Yeah, I, I, I feel pretty confident that it will be. Thank Questions you. came in. Uh -oh. I've been told today that I invite people into the show. I say when I advertise the show, join us, talk with us, and then I just don't shut up, which okay. is awful. So I should ask some of these questions before I'm a jerk. Okay. R. Xanadu asks, have you noticed that in most adventure games, the main character characters tend to speak aloud their own thoughts or obvious things like, that's a chair, when they look at things? Have you noticed yeah. that? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's a pretty useful convention, actually. Like, Spooks has that, Nanobots. Nanobots has that to a, a certain extent, but there's other characters for them to talk to. Like, you're playing as, as six different robots, so, like, if they say stuff aloud, you can pretend they're talking to the robots. Um, uh, actually, I haven't mentioned this at all. I wrote a game called PuzzleBots, also. That's my, like, only commercial game that's out right now. It's on Steam if you want to buy it for five dollars. Um, but like that's kind of taking the adventure game tropes and trying to trying to keep the good stuff about adventure game games, but get rid of the bad stuff. So like hmm. every level you play is self enclosed. You're not carting around useless inventory half the game. Like you're playing as these different robots that have these different abilities. So like one robot can pick stuff up and one robot can push heavy things and one can set things on fire and like. It's a way of giving you a couple different verbs in the game, but not sticking them all in one character. Because that was something I really didn't think worked very well in the old games. It's just like, you have one character and a bunch of different verbs you can cycle through, you know, push, pull, like, who knows what you're supposed to do at any given moment. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, now, I've always been curious as to why it went that way. The first adventure game I played was Maniac Mansion, mm-hmm. which had different characters with different abilities, and it made it interesting to kind of spread them around the map and and think about who you needed where. There was almost Mm -hmm. like a very, very, very light RTS feeling to Mm -hmm. getting your guys where you wanted them. And then that just kind of went away after a while. And uh, it was unfortunate, I thought. Well, I made two games that have that, so if you wanted to check those out. (laughs) Yeah, people should go play those games. Did you like the old uh, LucasArts games? Were they an I actually, I didn't play them when I was a child. I didn't know about them. I wish I had, you know. But Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we mostly had shareware games that my dad was able to find from... God knows where. You know, I think people just have, like, floppy disks. They're like, hey, you know, take this game to your kids. Like, we had no idea where they were coming from <laughs> back in the day. Um, uh, but, yeah, I played them when I was in college with my same friend who I, I played the uh, uh, Yahtzee's adventure game with. And they were really funny. Like, you can really tell that they have fun creating it. And that's something <laughs> that maybe is missing from a lot of games even today. Um, yeah, I think people uh, miss that. I think that... That's part of why, regardless of what Tim Schafer and Ron Gilbert put out, people love them even if they don't like their games. Like, I know people who say, I will buy whatever they put out forever because they are the kind of people I like and they at least want to make me feel how I want to feel. They may miss yeah. the mark sometimes, but they're, they're dedicated to them. And uh, yeah. it's wonderful to see that. It's a rare thing in, the, in this industry. Yeah, games with, a little, games with a little joie de vivre. You know, that's how I've heard it put. Like, huh. Yeah. People, it's not like trying to tell you something serious, and it's not trying to show you like a cutscene to explain why you should care about something. You know, actually, like, so my my background is in psychology. If I can go on a little bit of a story tangent here, um, oh please, like, the human brain, what it's good at is working with incomplete information and filling in the gaps. We're really good at that. But video game stories these days seem to be really dead set on telling you everything. Like, every corner of the story universe has to be fleshed out in case somebody wants to know. So you get these, you know... And it's not that saying this is a bad thing. Like, I actually really enjoy that about Skyrim, that this world is very well imagined. But, you know, I think you can tell a story without even, like, having to explain every step of the way what's happening. I think, like, movies, like, they don't tell you everything. You just put it together, and that's, like, it makes you feel smart. It makes you feel good. But, like, most games these days don't do that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, like. The, the, the... I think the de- developers are so excited that they can tell you everything mm-hmm. that they sometimes miss. Should I tell them everything? Yeah. Yeah, so, like, with Gravity Ghost, what I'm going to try to do is tell, like, the least amount of story possible to, like, get the idea across. We'll see how I end up doing. But that's, like, where I'm coming from. Is like, people can fill it in. You know, people already fill it in. You know, well, like... I'm, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, you start the game, and it's, like, a little ghost girl, a little ghost fox sitting on a planet. And people are like, oh, the ghost fox has come and found her in space, and he's woken her up so she can go. And I'm like, sure, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> People are they are good at that, you know? They'll just come up with something. that, And then they'll be like, am I right? And I'm like, I don't know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'll want to know because yeah. it, it makes them feel good if they got it right. But yeah, yeah. they can't really get it wrong, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you if you follow it at all, like the way Jonathan Blow talks about the story of Braid, he will not say one way or the other what it means and what's happening because I, I think it's better for people that way. It's it's better if people have their own idea of what it is, you know, that's like theirs and he doesn't want to like, well, he doesn't want people to lose that. I think that's really nice. Absolutely. Yeah, he's um, he's talked about that a little bit on this show before. He's a fun man. Funner than people think. They assume he's going to be like a, a person who makes you feel bad because no, he is smart and you are not. It's strange that he's 
strange that he's gotten that reputation. I don't know. I think. And people, like, uh, he also has a reputation for having made Braid intentionally um, difficult to understand the story of, so you would like only the smartest survive and like figure no. out what it's about. But he, well, um, a, he hasn't even revealed what it's about. Like you said, no. he's totally okay with that. Yeah. No, he's a great friend of the Indies too. Like he, like back when the guys were perfect working on Spelunky, Derek, you and, and Andy, they were like, he like gave them the source code to braid, you know, so they'd know how to develop for the Xbox and stuff. Like he'll just do stuff like that because he likes independent games and he likes helping the developers. Like nobody talks about that side. It's always like, Oh, what, what snobby thing is he going to say today? It's like, he's not, it's not snobby. It's just what he thinks. You don't even have to listen to him. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's the, and it, it relates to what we were talking about a little bit before in that when people feel threatened, they get mad, and when they get mad, they just suddenly start labeling people and dismissing yeah. people and, and feeling, and he does that. And, and it, it's, it's worrisome to me that so many people don't want someone to try to educate them or to, because they feel threatened if somebody, yeah. like, um, we talked a think, little bit before, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I think he most, like, when he criticizes AAA games and says they're not as good as people, you know, the story in this game is not as good as people pretend, like, I think he's hitting a nerve because I think he's mostly right, you know. Like, <laughs> like this is not this is not high culture, you know. The reason Apple doesn't allow games that criticize things politically on their platform is that games are not on the same level as books. They're not treated the same way because we've taught people that they're not important. You know, he says stuff like that, and that annoys people for some sure. reason. <laughs> yeah, the, the the term guilty pleasure is used for video games a lot, and it really irritates me. For one, I don't think people should feel guilty about having fun, and on top of that, yeah. video games don't have to be a time waster. They can be, no. like, the best, most important time you've had uh, in your life, potentially. Yeah, it's, but, you know, these days there are games that are just, like, designed to be very predatory and designed to eat up your time, you know? Like, I won't name any names, but, like, you know, the whole microtransaction thing is its the design of the video game is entirely based on what gets you to put money into it, you know, at mm -hmm. what point and how much. So if you think that's going to create games that are less quality, I think that's correct, you know. A lot of my yeah. housemates are playing this Mech Warrior game now, and that actually seems to be a lot of fun, where, like, it's free to play and anybody can jump right in, but you can buy these upgraded parts, but that doesn't mean you're going to dominate every match. And I think that's kind of the secret, is, like, you can still have this the ship you paid for or this mech you paid for, but you will not now dominate because a lot of games that are free to play but let you buy weapons, like if you put the money in, you're better than everybody. And it's like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a strange way to design the game if you want to keep, keep enjoying it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, well, all you're buying is self esteem, basically. You're not <laughs> buying, like, you didn't do anything, you didn't yeah. experience what the designer created for you, you just, like, bought the ability to kill a guy. Yeah. Oh, I just depressed myself saying that. And Sorry. I ignored the questions. That's okay. I, I tend to do that. Um, Sorry. And the questions happen. Not your fault. My fault. HDFXZ asks, what is your favorite game of all time? That's not hard to answer. Ooh. How about just a game you like well, a whole bunch? So right I, I will, I've, I've credited before King's Quest Seven with making me want to make games. That was the last King's Quest game we're talking about, and... <laughs> It had two female player characters that you could switch between, like, and it was, like, a really weird design. Like, there's six chapters, and there's this girl, Rosella, and her mother trying to find her. They're, like, in this crazy land, and it's just, like, an adventure game, you know, and I, I used to tell people it was my favorite game, and then I played it, like, I don't know, a couple Christmases ago, and I'm like, this game is a mess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's glorious, and I love it, but it's, like it seems to me like there was a lot of stuff in there that got cut because a lot of the story stuff was just, like, missing, you know? But as a child, I never beat it, so I never knew that. So I don't know. I'm, but, but that's, like, you know, it's still a special place in my heart because somebody was willing to make this thing, you know, even though it was really unconventional, even even for the 90s. Um, uh, I think that's a pretty good answer for favorite game of all time. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, playing a lot of, I'm playing a lot of Skyrim these days, like... I'm putting probably more hours into Skyrim than I have any AAA game that come out in recent years. I and, I have like two kids. I got married. I settled down. I bought three houses. Like this is not something I typically do in video games. In Skyrim, you did that. Yeah, in Skyrim, real. I did that. Yeah, ah, not in okay. real life. No, I'm a. <laughs> How many hours have you put into Skyrim? If you had to guess, eighty, maybe. Not even nothing. 
extraordinary. <laughs> Seems like kind of a lot. Yeah, maybe it's a lot. <laughs> I wouldn't feel bad about it. What do you think you like about Skyrim? What, what uh, makes it work there's for just, you? There's just so much there to explore and discover. There's so much content. I can't even fathom the number of human hours involved in that because every time you walk into like a dungeon, it's different. It's not they're they're using art assets, but like the, the geometry of the place is all custom. You know, like some artist has clearly thought about where everything is, right down to like there's a potion hidden in this bucket here if you look. Only if you look, you know, like I don't know. It feels like every corner where I want to look there's something interesting. Like I feel like mm -hmm. they've just like tapped into that. And I just like, yeah, keep coming back for more. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh it reminds me of the we talked about it last week on uh, the show with Vander Caballero, who made uh, Papa, uh, Papa and Yo, Papa and Yo. Um, he was really focused on game design school being faulty in that it should be industrial design. You should learn how to interact with objects and enjoy interacting with that object first, uh, and then cool. uh, from there think about um, what your game is and what design is. But if you don't like enjoying the interaction with just the objects, forget it. And, and Skyrim, people will forget all about the story, they'll forget all about the purpose, and just mm -hmm. want to interact with this giant object yeah. for 80 hours. I mean, you can you can walk in any direction in that game for any point and find something cool, you know. And, you know, you could be on a quest line that's like, hurry, we have to kill this dragon. You're like, no, I'm, a, I'm good. You can do whatever you want, you know. Like, there's, like, pretend hurry, you know, I don't know. I also like that you can just be helpful in that game. Like, you, every town you go to, it's like, oh, I'm having a real tough time with this overseer. He's working us to death. You could be like, I'll go talk to him for you. Like, Who the fuck am I? Like, <laughs> why am I and doing this? Works. But, yeah. then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you can actually make a difference in their world. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of neat. It yeah. Kinda neat. Yeah. I'm with you on that, hundred uh, percent. Yeah. Brother Dom asks. What kinds of other educational experiences could be useful for game making? For example, what majors that aren't programming and graphics related? Uh, Vander did mention industrial design last week, but uh, what what do you think would be helpful? What do you wish you well, had learned before you got into game developing? What would have helped you? There is there are schools that have like game design programs, and people often misunderstand what that means because they think it's art, they think it's you know combat, but it's not really. It's, it's more like systems design. So my boyfriend Steve also teaches video game design and he has this awesome example about like Mario 64. He asked them like, what does a coin do in Mario 64? And people are like, mm, you get a hundred of them, you get a one-up, you know, oh no wait, they give you health back, oh, oh they give you air when you're underwater, oh you know, like all of a sudden you realize it's hooked into like everything important in the game. There's like the coin stars you can get, where you get all the ones in one level and that gives you a star. Like all of a sudden the coins are hooked into like everything you're trying to do in the game. And that's like it's totally invisible, but that's why it always feels good to get a coin. You mm -hmm. know? And other games got it wrong where they're like especially other games around that time, they thought collection was the fun thing. So they came up with levels where you have to collect all the things and that's like the level design. It's like, no, that's not fun in itself. What makes it fun in Mario is that it's it's hooked into everything else, you know. It's like, and and there's weird stuff in Mario 64, like standing knee deep in water makes your health go back up, you know, like. That oh yeah, I forgot about that. That's game design, right? It doesn't have any bearing on anything in reality, but it's fun, so it's there, you know. Well, yeah, I'm a huge proponent for video game logic. It's half yeah. of why I like video games is to see what kind of surrealistic language yeah. the game developers Just can come up it. with. Yeah, yeah so, so like figuring out what is the system in your game and, and why does it matter and why would people care at any given moment what they're doing, you know, like, so in my game it's like you're collecting these stars from individual levels and the levels on the level map it's actually a constellation and when you complete that entire constellation something really good happens, you know, so it's like, yeah, huh. yeah it's going to be pretty so cool. Yeah, it sounds like a nice motivator. So is unlocking more art to look at part of what you're you're hoping people Well there is like for? exploration, you know. The the art for the planets and stuff changes over time. You start getting new planet types. We put in like bouncy planets and we put in like super dense high gravity planets that are hard to escape from because they make the game like, super interesting. We have a lot of that stuff. It's kind of introduced slowly over the course of the game, but like, you know, game design is also like the bigger picture of like where is this going, you know. Mm -hmm. In fact, before we had the level map in there, um, people would universally play for like 20 or 30 minutes, and they'd be like, 
this is cool. Where is this going? Like they expect there to be something bigger. You know, mm -hmm. they're like they buy into it for that long, but they expect something else to be going on by the time they hit that point. You know, not just like an endless series of linear levels, which is what it was before we had this like map where you saw kind of where you were. Right. It shows you like what is your progress and how far do you have to go. So the game has like a couple of different constellations, five I think, and then when you finish those, like that's basically when the game is over. Huh. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. What do you think it is about the world map that makes people feel like, oh, this is legit. This isn't because, just a bunch of levels. This is well, like a place. You can represent, yeah, there's that part of it too. You know, I mean, you can represent, represent somebody's progress as like a progress bar, which a lot, of, a lot of games do. But like a map is basically visual, you know, like, I don't know, like World of Goo has the same thing. Like it has a really simple level map and that like adds so much because if you get stuck on this level, you can try this level. You know, you can mm -hmm. try to find your own path and that's like, I think that's just like really good game design, you know, like you can, it's not punishing you for getting stuck, it's not curtailing your enjoyment of the game until you can solve this one thing, you know, maybe it's really hard for you, you can come back later. Yeah, yeah versus, strange that, versus sorry, adventure ahead. games, which are very bad about that. <laughs> like, I love the, the world map in Monkey Island. I don't yeah. know why, but I just love looking at it. I meant the getting stuck part. It. The getting oh, stuck sure, sure, part sure. is like the worst. In a yeah. puzzle game? Or mm -hmm. an adventure game? Yeah. yeah. In Puzzle Bots, I actually just stuck a big old hint button on the bottom left. Just, and it's funny because, um, uh, like adults playing the game would never ever hit the hint button. You know, they're like they want to figure it out, but just that it's there, I think helps. But mm -hmm. when children play the game, if they get stuck and they're like for a couple minutes, they'll just hit the hint button. They're not, they're not proud. You know, they're not, they're just like, oh, that's what it's there for. I'm just like, play on, kids. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. That's what you're yeah. playing for. Yeah. Uh, Gold Panda. Oh, wait. I mean, I a lot of questions this week. You, you're bringing in the questions, so thank you for doing that. There's a lot, though. I'm scrolling back to Slow Holmes, who asks, when do you think video games will be able to make large statements that have society-wide influence? Do you think a game could ever shape a worldview in the same way music does? Have they already? He asks. Yeah, like, woof. What's it going to take to make a game that makes uh, Vladimir Putin say, I'm going to be nicer to those punk rock girls and not uh, put them in jail because I'm not going to be a jerk anymore. I don't think a video game is what you're looking for there. Maybe a protest. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, is it possible? I don't know. Do think I, think, it's even... I think that like what I'm seeing lately, maybe not a worldview, but like just the saturation of some games, like Angry Birds. Kids around here at least are wearing like Angry Birds shirts like like kids used to wear, I don't know, like Space Jam shirts. I don't know. Like <laughs> they used to wear sure. like Nike logos and now they're wearing Angry Birds and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. just like it's such a cultural thing. It's like it's almost like it's a cartoon series, except it's not. It's a game on the iPhone or, you know, the mobile device of your choice. And like I was actually at a museum on Wednesday with some of my friends. It's a Native American art museum called the Herd Museum and we were looking at like Navajo blankets that they weave, and there was one, and it was like a really nice tapestry of like birds, and somebody, like a younger Navajo artist, had made one that's Angry Birds. It's like a parody of that original tapestry, but it's Angry Birds. And then there's like a little blue bird that represents him being mad that the Angry Birds are in his garden eating, eating his plants. And I'm just like, oh my god, there it is, in wool, like... Yeah, like, that's what, what we'll else? be remembered for. It's a video game. Nothing else in that museum has anything to do with video games, you know, but like that's like Angry Birds managed to make it that big, you know? <laughs> it's interesting. Like, it just shows I've, I've, up in weird places. Why did, what, have you puzzled over why Angry Birds has penetrated the culture like that and become so widespread? Well, uh, some of my friends believe it to be a victory of marketing more than game design because there are plenty of games that had similar ideas, you know? Hmm. I don't know, maybe people, it's like the perfect mobile game in that you can play it in short bursts on a train as you go to work. I mean, I think it's designed pretty well for the platform, and it's pretty fun. It's pretty hard, so it keeps you trying for a long time, and maybe people bond over their mutual frustration. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I think it makes people feel like they are an angry bird, and people have a little angry bird in them, like a cute but frustrated, like, eh, I'm just going to knock over this crap, and then... I should call some of my old psychology professors and ask them what they think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'm the angry bird. We all bird. have an angry bird projected. inside of us, don't we? <laughs> sure. uh, Turtle Boy 52387 asks, what is your budget for Gravity Ghost? That's like asking someone how much they get paid. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. But you can give us well, loose numbers I haven't, if you want. I haven't said this publicly before, but I can... Let's see. I would estimate the direct costs 
have been about fifteen grand so far, like Whoa. out of pocket. And there's also the indirect cost, which is like my own living expenses, like my food and stuff. So more than that. <laughs> yeah. So just being alive and paying for it to get made. And travel to conferences and stuff. I don't generally count in the budget of the game, but it's an important part of it. So airplane. Sure. Well, family. if you were working for you, you would yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, so count the, that. Yeah, for sure. So I, you know, like I figured out what I think my time investment is in this, you know, and I figured out how much I would like to make on this. And like I said, the game doesn't have to, it doesn't have to knock it out of the park. Just like a solid selling indie game, I will be content. You know, mm. like what I like is having the freedom to build what I like. And so I did that year of contract work to have the money to do this. You know, I was very intentional. I'm not going to drive myself crazy making this, you know, that's not, that's not good for anybody, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to be responsible about this, I think, yeah. Sure, but $15,000, I mean, there's so many other things you could have chosen to do with yeah, it. Yeah, I know, I joke with my friends about that, I'm like, what do normal people do with their money, do they just enjoy it, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I save it, I get scared and save it and wait yeah. for the, the government well, to collapse. Well, I just so have I'll... to, oh. not you too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, bury some, I was just kidding. I'm pretty bury confident. Some, right. Bury some golden guns in the desert as people do around here. Yeah, you're in uh, the southern states. I'm in a red right? state, yeah. yeah. Mm, Our grocery store has a nice friendly no guns please sign on the door. You know, it's not even, it doesn't even raise my alarm anymore. And I'm from Toronto originally, so this is like, it should be really jarring, but I'm just used to it. <laughs> yeah, you seemed adapt You seem quite adaptable. You adapted to Sweden and their whatever their money's called, and <laughs> you're adapting to wherever you are now. Yeah. Um, would you want to put Gravity Ghost on consoles if, uh, if it wasn't too would I? much of a labor? If it were not too much of a labor, I would totally want to. So, I mean, a lot of things go into determining platforms, like we're doing PC and Mac for sure because that's what Unity builds to naturally. And mm -hmm. I would like to be able to do Linux. That's becoming more of a possibility than it was. Um, especially because you have to be all three of those to get into the Humble Indie Bundle, which is something I would really like to do. Mm. Um, uh, but as far as like specific platforms, sometimes they like to have exclusivity, which means your game sits on their platform and not other platforms for a certain amount of time. And you would be spending money to make a port to get onto their platform in the first place. So you'd have to figure out how much money you expect to make on the platform versus how much it will cost you to do the port because usually that's the cost borne by the developer, not the platform holder, right? It's like mm -hmm. you have to pay to make the port and then, you know, they get a percentage and you get your percentage and you hope it works out. But, you know, I think if it does well enough on PC and it, it, it seems like people enjoy the game, then, then that would be a bigger reason to try for some of those. You know, people have suggested, like, People are always like, why, why aren't you developing for iPad? My, all my children and grandchildren love the iPad. Like, you sh it's mobile. It's the future. And I'm like, well, having a keyboard is very different from touching a screen. You know, like they don't perceive that there's a different input space. You know, like having a button that has feedback is very important to the game. I think. But that being said, you know, if it does well enough, I would love to try to see how it plays on touch screen. It's just not something we're doing out of the box. You know, it's like. We have to ship this thing, so we need to focus on like you know what what we know we can do. Sure, it's your fifteen thousand dollars. You want it to be the game that you yeah. want it to be first, and then if you make your money back, maybe you can play around with some other things. That's exactly. How, that's yeah, how it sounds. Well, I know quite a few uh, big name. I know some people at the the bigger console developers who I think would be really excited about it. So I'll make sure you know oh, who they thank are. Thank you. you know yeah, oh, no problem. Let me know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of people I have in mind. Right okay. now, but I'll save that for later. Crunch2600 asks, I think you're using Unity 3D for Gravity Ghost, question mark. How important is the... <laughs> Maybe this is someone you know or follows you. Um, uh, anyway, how important is the advancement of easier, better tools against getting more well-versed in programming? Tools are very helpful. Uh, you know, it's funny because everybody I know who I would consider a real programmer hates Unity. They hate that they can't go in and have executive control over all of the systems, you know. But for somebody like me who just, like, wants to get it on the screen and working, Unity is beautiful, you know. Like, what was nice about Gravity Ghost is that when I was trying to do it myself or I had friends helping me try to figure out how to implement stuff, like, that was the way it existed for kind of the first year of its life. By the time I found like the programmer, I had a playable prototype, and I'm like, I just need you to make this in a way that will not fall apart, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, and and like, 
now it's nice because I can tell him, okay, here's everything I want to have in the game. So when he's coding it, he has this kind of bigger picture in mind versus somebody like me who's like, I can code an individual implementation, but I don't know how to make it all fit into under this umbrella of, like, the finished game, right? So there's a lot of stuff that's been going in lately, like persistence. You know, when you collect a star in this level, it stays collected in your instance of the game. And things like saving the game, we need to put that in, right? You have to... It has to save all the things you've gotten already. And, like, like this is a mistake. I mean, I, I forgot we had to do that because Adventure Game Studio, that's a native feature, but Unity doesn't have that. So you, you need to custom write it and stuff. And I'm just like, you know, there's, there's things that add to dev time. I mean, I'm happy with our progress now because... Like I said, I think most of the game is there, but we just need these things like like the map, like persistence, and then we have a nice cushion of time between us and the release date that I hope to put into art and story polish, and then other things that I forgot. <laughs> you know, it's like a nice buffer zone. Because yeah. it just happens. I don't know. It's like we're not running a huge company here. You know, I'm working from my own experience, and so is Mike, so there's bound to be stuff. Sure, and it's nice that you have that that time instead of a hard and fast deadline where you just yeah. have to ship it no matter what. Um, yeah. That's one of the other things AAA devs I know are just so miserable about is that they're like, they forced us to put out the game, we weren't done, and now we have to live with it. We're, we're the ones who are going to be held responsible. So uh, another perk of your life, which is Yeah, nice. I mean, it's nice. It's Yeah, it's hard. You know, there are days when it's just like, I feel like I have so much to do and it's really hard to get anything done, you know, but it's like, Eventually, like earlier this week, I took two days off in a row from even looking at the thing, and now I'm getting a lot done. You know, it's like hard to draw that line sometimes. It's like if it's like you're dreading sitting down on your computer, it's time to like take a little break. And it's nice yeah. being indie because you can do that. Like my weekend was Wednesday, I went to the museum, and then you know Thursday I hung out with Steve. Like and now I'm back to work. So <laughs> like so right. you know, so but you, yeah, I'd imagine if you make yourself miserable, your game won't turn out same either. Yeah, it's, I mean, we're making entertainment, we're not making accounting software, right? You have to have some, some levity in it, I think. Sure, sure, that makes sense. the way I like sense. to make things, yeah. And where am I with questions? Um, Dino Puncher, have we asked his question yet? I don't think so, I would remember that's, a name like that. Yeah, me too, what a cool name. I have name. a tiny Wonder dinosaur right here that's, that's Steve. Punch it. Me. Oh, oh, he's cute. Yeah. <laughs> Dino Puncher asks, I have a question. How big of an asset is it to live with a bunch of other developers compared to your previous games? Where it's you, you really weren't nice. living? Yep. I was living okay. alone in my previous, uh, yeah. Like when I worked on PuzzleBots, I was living alone. So, so that that was not so ideal when you're self-employed. Mm. And and I, I lived in Montreal for part of it, and it was the winter, and it was just like the worst thing ever. Just like you're like trapped in your cube of an apartment. Huh. You want to put on four layers of coats to go get a Tim Hortons sub or something. But that was a very Canadian thing I just said. Um, no, it's very good. Yeah, no, it's 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 really good to be around other people who know what you're going through, like, and to have a partner who knows what I'm going through and understands like why I do this. Like that's so awesome, you know. Like, I feel like sometimes people, if they're creative and they're ambitious, you know, and they have their their partners like you know just more like a, a salaried employee at a bank or something. Like it, it causes some like disagreements, you know. They like. They don't understand like why would you spend all this money on this thing? But it's I'm, I feel pretty lucky that I have you know Steve and then I have like Kyle and Corey both do this. Like we have a we have a podcast where the indiegamehouse.com. It's like oh cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We try to record once in a while. Um, but Kyle Pulver is a he's made awesome games like Snapshot and Offspring Fling and stuff. And so it's like he works in like Flash and and some other things. I don't know. His like He's like the the king of game jams, and it's really awesome having his like expertise in the house. You know, like he knows everything about. Well, I shouldn't say anything because he get mad at me, but he knows everything about like state machines and like how to create something really fast and ship it and be done with it. Like a year ago, he set a goal for himself to have five new games done by DDC, and he's going to do that. Like it's gonna, yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. So. Kyle it's, yeah, yeah. You should have him on the show if you haven't already. I'd love to have Kyle Pulver on the show. Yeah, I'm we're booked for a bit, but he'll he's more we'll than see if he's writer. awake. <laughs> <laughs> and um do you have you ever thought of collaborating with Steve on a game? People ask us that. <laughs> it's funny because I don't know if that's such a good idea cuz like we're both designers, you know. I feel like working with a programmer is really nice cuz they have their thing they do and I have my thing and it's not like Yeah. I don't know. I think it could be good. I think 
it would be very stressful, especially if there was like a, you know, if we come to a point where it's like, well, I think we should do it this way. It's like, well, I, I think this diverging thing, and then, I don't know. I mean, we, we have friends who do like the, we have friends who are like, you know, a husband and wife team who like make games together, and I'm like, I, I've i asked, you know, the woman, I'm like, how, how does that even work? And she's just like, it's very intense, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, that was I, her I, word I, for it. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you'd have to thrive on friction and get a lot yeah. of emotional energy from yeah. fighting and making up a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which is not yeah. how I operate. And yeah, not no, not even fighting, like creative disagreements, because those can be just yeah. as bad. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not a, a, a hostile, like you're trying to hurt the other person fight, yeah. but it's a, it's a conflict where no one can win sometimes. Yeah, That's no, a, it's, a risk. and I do this because I like to create what's in my brain, you know, mm -hmm. so... You know, I don't so know. So being Maybe, more of the support role to each other as opposed yeah, to yeah, yeah, just like and listening. It's like, hey, I have this new system I'm trying to build. I don't know how it's going to fit into everything else. And then he's really good at like listening and offering advice and stuff like that. Like that's really, it's really awesome. Yeah. I think I figured out which Steve this is too. Okay. I wasn't too nosy about your life before being <laughs> on the show because I thought that would be intrusive. But oh, no. I think this Steve is even going to be on this show later. I hope I think so. He said that. Yeah. Yeah, he's a hunk. Wow. Great job. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> your time. Uh, Gold Panda asks, what do you think about Dark Souls and passive integrated multiplayer? It's something that opened, uh, Dark Souls opened a different kind of multiplayer uh, up to a lot of people who I feel kind of had a, they thought multiplayer was cool. They just love the idea of being able to get social without having to deal with actually being social. Mm -hmm. um, but then they burnt out on getting called racial slurs on the internet for As one would. And then Dark, yeah. <laughs> then Dark Souls came out and was like, yeah. you can be with people without even hearing them. I thought it was really cool, you know, and, and I think maybe it's just part of how we grew up, but a lot of my friends and my peers are just like, they like single player games because it's you and the game, however you want to play, doing whatever you want at any time, right? But Dark Souls, it seemed like, made a nice bridge between those two things. Personally, I haven't played it. I, like, started to play it, and then I just got too busy. I made this mm -hmm. cute little eyeless ghoul with red, a red ponytail. Um, That's uh, pretty badass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I, watched, I watched Steve play a lot of it, and I watched my brother play a lot of it, and just, like, it looks so difficult, and I love that they went there, you know, mm -hmm. that it's totally against the kind of the, the convention of, like, dumbing things down for the main, for the, I guess, the, you know, the more... Yeah, accessible the gaming audience. Common denominator. Sure. What kind of things you know a gamer would get upset about? <laughs> um, Gee, no, I but I I would watch him like play for an hour and then die and just like just rage. <laughs> and uh, you know I'm like games don't really do that very much anymore. They're they're usually pretty forgiving. Like even having like a save point, most games are getting away from. I feel like because it's like pretty punishing if you screw up. And even like sure. Dark Souls, the whole thing where you you're collecting souls and then you die and all your souls stay in that spot where your body was and if you die again you lose them all like like that is brutal. Yeah, they they were willing to make you feel a true sense of loss. Yeah, sure. but even like the one of the things that I when I saw it I was like I can't believe they did it is like if you have like a giant weapon like a halberd and you're swinging it and it clips the wall it doesn't do any damage after that it doesn't hit the enemy like. You have to know where the walls are. It's like swinging, like it's how it would actually work. You know, I'm like, wow, you, you have to know where you are when you swing your weapon and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Very impressive that they put all that into it. Yeah. Yeah, they were willing to tax your ability to deal with spatial relationships on a level that a lot of other games just don't dare to do. Yeah. It's just mash X to win. Yeah. Uh, oh, our Xanadu's... I'm sorry, say again? I was going to say all my spatial abilities are in video games now. I feel like I'm losing the ability to see distant objects. <laughs> just like, it's just going away. <laughs> yeah, you, see, you seem like you, you picked up that dinosaur okay. and moved That's it true. It's, it's within my arm's reach. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Look, his little mouth opens. Oh, the, is that a velociraptor? I think it's a baby T-Rex. There's a there's oh. the mommy. The mommy's somewhere else, but I wouldn't let Steve put that by my computer because I figured I'd knock it over. <laughs> These are his, uh, by the way. He's a grown man, and this is, yeah. He's got like 30 of well, these. Dinosaurs never go out of style. No. Uh, they're, they're always hot on the streets. Geekabell asks, do you think the Kickstarter movement is having any effect on the gaming industry as a whole, or is it more of a self-contained event? I'd want to tack on Ouya to that. 
And so I think about Ouya every day and how is that going to be the thing that really changes the way consoles are done. I, I want it to, but I kind of doubt it will be. You know, the, you the Ouya, I'll, I guess I'll answer the second part first. The Ouya, like, I was going to wait and see how it played out, you know, before I would even consider developing for that. I mean, as you've probably deduced, I have so many resources and I have to make sure that they're going the right direction, right? But they hired Kelly Santiago to do their developer outreach stuff, I think, and, like, she's awesome and she's a friend of mine, and, like, if she told me, like, you should develop for this console, I would. You know, she's a good choice for them because I, I take her word and she she knows the space and stuff. So, like, kudos to them for finding somebody with, like, you know, mad indie cred to try to, you know... I mean, I imagine it would be a great console for indie games depending on how many consoles they're able to ship into people's homes, you know? Mm -hmm. I guess that remains to be seen. I'm curious now. Like, it's more on my radar than it was. Because Before. of Kelly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, what was the first part? Kickstarter. Do you think that's oh, going to yeah. change everything, or just uh, things in a very small well, area? Well, I think Kickstarter is awesome. I know people are like to talk about it, you know, being past its prime, but I think what they're seeing is they're seeing product they don't like, so... They're interpreting that as being... Because a lot of things are still really successful on there, you know? And I think we've probably seen a little bit of, like, big companies trying to replicate the success of somebody like Double Fine, you know? You have established IPs asking for a million dollars and things that kind of seem like they're not so much in the Kickstarter space, you know? Kickstarter seems to be like it was more for these small projects, you know? Like, independent creators, people making art installations or, you know, small print graphic novels or indie video games, but... It's interesting that the success of those products has made the bigger people want to move into the space. So it's really interesting right now. It's like I'm really not sure which way it'll go because I'm sure Kickstarter doesn't mind when a project gets a million dollars. You know, I guess it's like, <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So. And and I've seen uh, Mariel Cartwright, who was on the show a while back. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's uh, an animator, but works almost exclusively in games That's these cool. days. Her name is almost that. Mario Kart. <laughs> I'll tell I thought you that's you what said you that. said. Don't tell her I said that. Nobody tell <laughs> no, her I said would, that. <laughs> I don't think she would mind uh, hearing that. Uh, she worked on Skullgirls, um, which recently went back to Kickstarter to fund That's right. I didn't hear about characters. that. Yeah. And then that just blew up. They made that money uh, within like 48 hours or something like that. And she was also yeah. working on a game called Cryomore, which um, I think their initial goal was like 600000 and they mm -hmm. made it to like 150000 Yeah, I mean, 000. the... The like the success story for me is is FTL. You know that they had this sh this they had this game that was almost done. They just needed a little bit more for the ending. And I think they used Kickstarter as a vehicle for deploying pre-orders as well. You know, like most people who paid into that wanted the game. They didn't want the Kickstarter high five for a dollar. You know, they wanted like the game. And so that's like just another way to get your initial round of like sales. You know, I don't. And then in that case, if it, if it goes way over the money they ask for, well, it's not even like people expect the game to be that much better. It's like they just expect the game they paid for, you know? So Right, so it's just yeah. buying, it's pre-buying a game. And then yeah, just... basically. And But that, that also means that, like, when the game comes out, those people aren't going to buy it again, you know? Like, mm -hmm. those are done sales, you know? So, sure. I don't know, it's interesting. Like, I, I don't know. It's on my radar, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good to know. Yeah. Um, and Arzanadu asked another question. Which, uh, for some reason, I've been thinking about this, too, this whole time, Arzanadu. Weird. Would you like to see a Zelda game where Zelda is the main character? I wasn't thinking that specifically, but I have been thinking about Legend of Zelda while talking I'm to you. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I've never actually played a Zelda game. Interesting. Uh, we'll keep doing the question for funsies, because it seems only right, but um, you may not have an answer, and that is okay. Uh, that would be cool. I think, I think it would be awesome, you know? I mean, I'm sure everybody saw the story about the the dad who hacked uh, Wind Waker so that Link's gender pronouns were all female, so his daughter thought it was a little girl playing. You know, yeah, that was a few girl. years back, I think. And then yeah. I was actually looking for that story so I could link to it on a story I uh, wrote uh, yesterday mm -hmm. that I also saw on your Twitter feed about... The Donkey uh, Kong, yeah. Yeah, a guy who made Pauline the playable character in Donkey Kong and uh, Mario the, uh, the character you uh, rescue. Yeah. Uh, You'll note that it doesn't it doesn't change one iota of the game design, you know, especially for a game like that where it's pure like arcade. I don't know, like for people to say it's impossible to have games with female protagonists, it's like, well, no, we can. It's it's far from impossible. It's very possible, you know, and it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt the design of the game at all. Yeah, because the design a, of the game isn't the story, you know, like 
Mario is a game about an Italian plumber, and, you know, he could be going down ladders instead of pipes, and it would still be the same game about running and jumping, you know. It's just yeah, like, the, the, it's a different the only, skin. <laughs> the, the difference was I was marveling at how cool she looked while she was jumping in the air with that little kick yeah. uh, from under her dress, whereas with Mario, I just think that's so cool that they made his mustache out of, uh, his nose out of a mustache, yeah. basically. That was a neat trick. Yeah, but, well, um, the... The main character in Gravity Ghost is female. You know, she's a little, a little ghost, and her, she's very like fabricy. I wanted her to be like she's actually invisible, but you can see where she is because she's wearing these like ghosty cloak things. So that's been really fun slash difficult to animate. Um, I hope it'll look really neat in the final version. Like I'm trying to figure out how to animate all these little moments of like sometimes the gravity gets you to do a little loop de loop, and I want to have a special animation for that because it feels really fun when it happens. You know, so. Hopefully well, that'll Unity, and Unity doesn't have any cheats for that with 2D art, does it? No, it's a 3D engine, so everything right. is like custom. Yeah, no, we've put a lot of thought into it, but um, yeah, you know, I'm hoping people just like the game, and that the fact that the female character will be kind of an afterthought. You know, I'm, it could be either way. You know, it it could have been a, a male ghost, and it wouldn't really change anything. But mm. personally, I think it looks cool with a dress. You know, and I think that like there's a there's a huge amount of space there for people to explore. I don't know. <laughs> and you're dead, so it kind of doesn't matter what, what you got. It doesn't matter what you are. Anyway, that <laughs> yeah. That's way of putting it. Yeah, that's how I put it, sadly. And we're <laughs> still... Uh, Five-minute warning, three-minute warning, actually. Well, did, okay. Let's see. Did we talk about all the things that you that I wanted to talk to you about and that you wanted to talk about? We talked about your teaching. Yeah. We talked about your game. We talked about your past games. We talked about Elmo. We talked about Sweden. Um, there was a the Global Game Jam. Missed? Oh, yes, we told, I knew we forgot something. You gave the keynote speech at the Global Game Jam. Please tell us about that while we still have some time. Uh, that was really surprising and awesome because, you know, I participate in game jams, but I don't win them. You know, I, I'm not there yet, but I, uh, I don't even know how they found me. I think, I don't know, maybe they saw my comics or something. But, yeah, I just put together this, like, four-minute video where I'm, I'm taking advice mostly that I got from Kyle because he's like the king of game jams, as I said, about like how to make something really good in a short amount of time, you know, picking out, you know, a, a finished sprite sheet that's crappy is worth more than like a cool character that's not done, you know, like just just like try to lock it down and get it out the door. But then I threw in a bunch of like non sequiturs that I thought were pretty funny. People seem to really like it. I got a lot of nice tweets from people. So that was huh. that was nice. You can look to the video maybe. Or maybe, I think you looked at my, my blog post where I talk I about I it. I think the it has the video cool. embedded. Anyways, yeah. maybe it wouldn't make sense to like the non game jammer crowd, but I yeah, I try to put in some actual good advice inside of all the nonsense cartoons I like to draw. Yeah, you do uh you do a lot of interesting drawings. People should check them out. They're oh, they're thanks. adorable. Thank uh, you. Yeah, it's true, they're very well done. Um and people should get into games jams. I think people don't realize that you can just if you're willing instead of going camping that weekend, you just commit to your computer. And you can show and, up like a lot of game jams do team stuff, so if you show up and you want to do art, somebody who's a programmer who can't do art will be so happy to have you there, you know, like, it, it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> just make the little castle, make the little knight, I don't know, it's like, I, I like to think it's a very democratic way of making games and that, that anybody who shows up, they'd have room for you, you know, mm -hmm. even if even if you want to, like, write a story or something, you could probably find somebody who would let you write, like, the intro blurb of the game or something. Yeah. I haven't tested, but, you know, I... I like to think that they would be very welcoming of that. Most of the people I know who participate in game jams are like the coolest people. So yeah. It seems to me that it's often people who they know what they want to be able to do, and if they can find someone else to do the other stuff, mm -hmm. it's a relief. And there's yeah, not, it's it not is. like you're getting picked last on the team. It's like everyone no. is the star player on the team. You just need to get on a team, and you're, you're yeah, already sure. a star. Yeah. And I feel like there are people who are, are artists, but they want to get into game art, and that's a really good way to learn You know what you need to do. Like... A lot of the stuff that I do in Gravity Ghost is very until, like, everything that's important is, like, really bright and really white, and everything else is dark blue and goes into the background, you know, because if, when you're flying around, it's happening really fast. You need to know it in a second, like, what, what it is you're seeing. So, you know, I started making, like, these trees for the planets, and then I, I made them white, but it was too distracting, so now I'm going to make them all darker so they kind of fade away when you're going past them and stuff. Like, stuff like that you wouldn't know unless you actually worked on the game as far as, like, how do you signify to the player what is important and what is not at any given moment? And like, you know, if you want to draw people's attention, you make something move and stuff like that. I don't know. It's yeah, all like, that, it's all stuff. Very... I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Well, it's just a specific way of making art that's different from just doing an illustration, say. And Adventure Games is a great background for that, because a lot of those did them very well. Unlike Resident Evil, where everything just shines. Oh, it's really? Like it's a game for looking for shiny things, and then you pick mm. it up. The first one, anyway. That depressed mm. me. Still yeah. depressed about it. Would you make a new Resident Evil for me? <laughs> I haven't played those either. Sorry. Okay, well, think about it, because that would I be will. fun. I would I prefer say, that. A lot of Adventure Games have screwed that up, too, by having everything be really colorful, and then the one thing you want is, like, in the pile of colorful objects, you have to click on the right... They call it pixel oh. hunting in the yeah, Adventure yeah, Game yeah. Studio community. Wait, it's, a, it's a real taboo. Oh, we have so many They little... did a little of that in Cave Story, where there's just a very, very small man you have to talk to, but he's literally, like, three pixels yep. tall. I remember that's finding cool. him the, the first time I played it, and then he's for, like, a later quest that's not even announced in any way. It's no. It's, like, a secret. Yeah. <laughs> But we should wrap up the show, sadly. Did yes. we end on a good enough note? Is there anything you want to end on? People should follow you, Lively Ivy, on yeah, be uh, cool. Twitter. And you've yeah. got your, your website is, uh, there's gravityghost.com, and there's also your site, which mm-hmm. is livelyivy.com? Livelyivy.com, yeah. And then yeah. gravityghost.com is the Gravity Ghost devlog, if you're interested in what's going into the game at any given moment. And then, yeah, awesome. just follow me on Twitter. I post all that stuff there, so that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're fun to follow on there. And me, I'm uh, Tron Knotts on Twitter. What can you do with me? You can uh, listen to the show on iTunes. There's tons of reruns now. We've done like 50 of them. A lot of great people like uh, Jonathan Blow, who we talked about earlier, Rami Ismail of uh, Vlambeer. The list goes on. We've had a, a great... Uh, so lucky to have people like you on the show. Thank you for willing to do oh, it. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a big risk. You didn't know what I was going to be like. I could have no, been... No, it's true. Yeah, I wasn't the worst, I hope. No, no, um, you're, you're good. I'm fine, I guess. You ask good and questions, I, and you ask, oh, the, you ask the gender questions in a way that's not infuriating, so I appreciate that. That's neat. I try not to infuriate. It's one of my, every morning I get up and think, don't infuriate anyone today. Yeah. Uh, also, I did a cartoon. I don't want you to watch it because no. I don't want you to judge me because it's got a lot of swears in it. You don't seem like a swearer. I swore like twice. I was in this interview. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't notice. Anyway, okay, King good. of Pokemon. It's on Machinima. This episode is about PAX. It's the season finale. Please do watch it if you are okay with a couple of swears. And that's it for me. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thanks again, Aaron. Bye. Bye.